both the Center for Security Policy and, uh, and EMET, uh, the Endowment for Middle East Truth, are very important organizations conduct, waging an extremely important fight for the truth about what's happening in the Middle East and the effect of uh, Middle East issues on our own society and in our own government. So I'm very glad and very honored to be here. Um, <clears throat> now, where to begin? What's happening in Gaza right now uh, and the, uh, the fact that the President of the United States has to appeal to the Egyptian President to calm the situation, something he wouldn't have had to do in the same way with Hosni Mubarak, is uh, basically what, what I'm, really the, 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 the nub of what I'm about to talk about, and that is uh, how we got here and what has changed since the Arab Spring in Egypt, and what, is, what has changed since the, the, the coming to power of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood was established in Ismailia in Egypt by Hassan al-Banna in 1928. And its strategy for taking power, by the way, it was a Salafi organization at the time, and it considers itself now to be a Salafi organization. So this, these terms, as you may have heard uh, in the debates about Egypt, the Salafis versus the Muslim Brotherhood, the Salafis are the bad guys, and the Muslim Brotherhood, some people think, are the good guys, at least in comparison, are a bit misleading, and we'll talk about that. But as an as a Islamist organization established in 1928, from that point on, it had, its goal was to achieve state power to, in order to build an Islamic state and to restore the caliphate, which had been abolished by Ataturk in uh, 1924. So, uh, it's, it's, it announced a strategy of what's called a da'wah, which is to build this new Islamic state through <clears throat> infiltration of its existing institutions, uh, providing services uh, that government does not provide to uh, people, to Muslims basically, and to uh, use the, the machinery, the existing machinery of state power to promote its agenda and to, and to finally take over state power. So uh, that includes, of course, in the end elections. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is often referred to as a nonviolent organization, but in fact its history is full of violence. And uh, it was driven to, to sort of openly declare its, its uh, renunciation of violence in, in, in Egypt. That's very important, a very important distinction. In Egypt, in order to survive under the uh, military dictatorship that was established in 1952. Uh, so they, and there was a considerable conflict between uh, Abdel Nasser and his people, who took over in 52 from King Farouk. And the Brotherhood, which were its allies, the, 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 you know, the, the free officers' allies, actually, before they took power, uh, they were not, the free officers were not willing to share power with them, and they, they wound up being in, in, host, in a hostile relationship with each other. And some violence continued even then. There was an attempt to kill Abdel Nasser that may have been staged, may not have been staged by the, uh, by the security services to, to give them an excuse to crack down. But in... Not, in, in the 70s, there was a reversal of this policy under Anwar Sadat, where Sadat, who was, uh, trying, who was a successor to Nasser when he died in 1970, was trying to combat Nasser's uh, leftist opponents by turning to the Islamist right, uh, which had been, basically, basically they were in prison, they were, they were in the torture chambers and in prison cells at that time, and he took them out and he, uh, gave them license to take over the student unions, the, you know, the professional syndicates, and you know, carry on activities that would combat the influence of the leftists that opposed uh, Sadat himself. And this, of course, came to fruition, uh, unfortunately, with the assassination of Sadat in 1981 by uh, groups that were basically offshoots of the Muslim Brotherhood, by a group that was an, an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, and it was led by um, Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, who is now uh, in North Carolina serving a life sentence for plotting to blow up the World Trade Center in 1993. So uh, there is a, a long history of trying you know, to work with the Muslim Brotherhood and finding that you can't work with them. That's one lesson to take from that. Another is that uh, we turned against Mubarak uh, because 
there was no legitimate opposition to him. We thought that he, there was no demo, democratic base in Egypt. There was no democratic space allowed, we thought, in Egypt. So when there was a, an uprising against him, uh, our government, which I was already predisposed to support Islamist movements, I, I believe, uh, as believing that the Muslim Brotherhood was a bulwark against more radical ones, which it's actually allied with, they, they actually helped push Mubarak out. And uh, they gave, him, they gave no, no, no one any time to establish an alternative or to work through a transition that might have led to a different result. He was Im immediately ousted, and that was that. Uh, so we, we have a situation, and, and when he was ousted, uh, we didn't even appreciate how much more democratic it was. I mean, not so much democratic, but liberal, really liberal compared to what was going to follow. So the sort of values that we would prefer to have in, in Egyptian society were really at risk in this transition even if democracy was not coming from a bar. That's one of the values we wanted to encourage in Egypt, of course, and President Bush tried to do that. Uh, but to go back to that revolution, the revolution was allegedly started, as we've all heard, as a result of this Facebook movement in uh, January 20, on January 25th, 19, or, I'm sorry, 2011, you know, to January 25th, 2011, there was going to be uh, demonstrations launched via Facebook by a group uh, that was basically uh, coming out of another group that had led a national strike in 2008 or in 2009 called the April 6th Movement. The April 6th Movement <coughs> was actually a coalition of so-called li secular liberal groups that had been working closely with the Muslim Brotherhood. And they were a big part of the, of the general strike, in fact. It was, of course, unsuccessful. It was under Mubarak, and he cracked down on it, and it didn't work. But it provided a coalition that was used for the next opportunity. And that was given to them with the beating death of an Alexandrian uh, activist named Khaled uh, Said in an internet cafe in Alexandria uh, by the police. So on National Police Day, which was January 25th, they decided to launch these demonstrations uh, in protest of the abuse that led to his death and the entire system itself. And of course, one of the binding elements of this coalition was a hatred of Israel and a hatred of the Camp David Treaty, which was signed by Sadat with uh, Menachem Begin and supported by the United States. It is the basis of our military and other assistance to Egypt to this day. This. Uh, picture, unfortunately, is inaccurate of what, how it was st actually started. Because, as I said, this coalition was actually working with the Muslim Brotherhood beforehand. The website on uh, Facebook, or the, the Facebook page, actually, that launched or played a key role in launching the revolution of January 25th uh, was Kulana Khaled Said. We are all Khaled Said. And the two people that ran it had an association with the Muslim Brotherhood. One of them has, was a former member. That was uh, this famous Google executive, Wal Ghanim, who everyone thought was a secular liberal in the media, but in fact he, he is something else, perhaps. And he certainly was, was at one point something else. And he has no doubt con many connections still to the Islamist world. And uh, uh, Adrahman Mansour, uh, who is apparently politically loyal, according to the Muslim Brotherhood itself, to the Muslim Brotherhood. So from that point on, you already have a, a, a false portrait uh, being you know, given to the, the public of what the false picture is being given to the public of who these people really are. But the media simply wasn't aware of these facts and did not really dig for them. There was a narrative being constructed that it was a very positive you know, people's movement that was not about Israel and not, about, and not uh, to do with promoting Islamism. And the Islamists would never get elected and, you know, don't worry about those people. They're a secular liberal group anyway, according to James Clapper. Or at least uh, he, he had to correct that statement, but he didn't make it at one point. So, uh, the key thing to remember about what happened in those demonstrations was that the first actual protests on January 25th were limited, but they still were bigger 
than anything seen under Mubarak previously, which showed some signs of weakening of the regime. The Muslim Brotherhood committed itself to the movement without actually committing its activists to supporting it on the first day of demonstrations. They'd sent this the youth wing, which many people thought was the most important element of the Muslim Brotherhood. It turned out it was not at all. Uh, I never bought that line, but that's many people, many people who wanted to believe it was a liberal organization will look at the youth wing and say that represents the actual Muslim Brotherhood. And of course, of course they are a marginal movement in the Muslim Brotherhood. And the, on the 28th, which was the next actual day of protests, because they had seen this unusual success for the first day, the Muslim Brotherhood threw everything they got and they issued an order saying it's wagib, it is obligatory for uh, that's activists to promote this wave of protests and to go to the mosques and mobilize people and get them to come to Tahrir Square or wherever else they were in the country where the protests were happening. And that's what really launched the revolution. And who, the, the crowds you saw in the square were not necessarily Muslim Brotherhood members. They were, in fact, people that responded to the Muslim Brotherhood's call. And it took the Muslim Brotherhood's organization to generate this uh, kind of turnout. It was their mobilization ability that led to the success of these demonstrations. So many people got lost in the idea of, well, they're not all wearing beards. You know, <laughs> they can't all be Islamists. It doesn't matter. It just shows the organizational strength of the Brotherhood. And by the way, most Islamists don't wear beards. <laughs> uh, so, or certainly a great many of them. So uh, here we have you know, this kind of false media impression which was seized upon and amplified by academics and by government experts and by the U.S. administration. But you see, this, but even here the story is not adequately uh, revealed. You have to go back a little bit further, and that is to June 4, 2009, when President Obama went to Cairo, jointly sponsored by Cairo University and Al-Azhar University the most important Islamic center you know, in the Sunni world, and gave a speech uh, in which he invited the Muslim Brotherhood's representatives, who were illegal at that time. They were, they, it was an illegal organization, or a semi-tolerated illegal organization, to, sit, or to come, and not just to come, but to sit in the front row. Well, this, of course, excluded his hosts in Egypt, and his true house, I mean, from point of view of protocol, uh, President Mubarak and his government. So it was basically a direct communication between the President of the United States to an illegal organization operating in a foreign country, where the, where the foreign country involved was a, an ally of the United States, our closest regional ally besides Israel, and where these basically these criminal elements <laughs> were, uh, were elevated to, the, to, the, to being the status of heads of state, de facto. He was saying to the Muslim Brotherhood, you are the future by doing this. And it turned out to be true. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. I, th I really believe the January 25th revolution, as, as such, began on June 4th, 2009. None of this was caught by anybody at the time, in the media. But not only did President Obama directly address those people, clearly he was focusing on them, but he also made this, I mean, the, 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 the point of the speech was to address the Muslim world, which is not a diplomatic entity. We've never had a relationship with anything called the Muslim world before. <clears throat> There's no such thing in diplomatic terms. He was asking people, as Barry Rubin has written very well about this, he's asked people to redefine themselves, people in the, in the Arab and Muslim worlds, he's asked them to redefine themselves not as national, nationalists or patriots to a certain nation state or group of nations, uh, who, are, who have common, maybe, uh, ethnic bonds or something like, of this nature, like the Arab League. Rather, he's asking them to define themselves by their religion and to disregard state boundaries and other forms of identity in privileging this one. It's, in essence, an Islamic supremacist idea. 
So this is the real tragedy of what we're doing. And I think the, the case of Egypt is really uh, the, most, the most revelatory, the most revealing of uh, all the examples we can find. But there are many others. Now, in terms of uh, the main topic of our, uh, our discussion, actually, this is all just background. But uh, the, 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 the main point is really quite simple. Egypt has had a, a nuclear program for 58 years. It began uh, in 1954 under President Nasser, and it was in response to, Dwight, to uh, Dwight Eisenhower's December 1953, I think it was, speech to the uh, United Nations about the peaceful atom. And they you know, had a, a small, very small reactor built, a research reactor built by, by, by the Russians in 2000. I'm sorry, 1954. And then another one came along in 1998 that was built by Argentina primarily and was supplied with fuel by Russia and Argentina. A slightly larger, but still just a research reactor. But they also developed a hot cell laboratory, which allows them to extract plutonium from uh, the fuel rods used in the light water reactor, the second one that was finished in 1998. So they, they can actually produce uh, about six kilograms or slightly more than six kilograms per year of plutonium, which is six kilograms is the, the amount needed to make one bomb. So annually for the last 25 years or 24 years, they have actually been creating enough material to make 24 nuclear bombs if they just use it for that purpose. Now they're also doing medical research and things like this, working with isotopes, et cetera. So they may, be, they may be using this plutonium for other purposes. I'm not sure. Another issue that's raised by this is whether or not they have an ongoing fuel supply for this, uh, the second, the ETRR-2 reactor that was completed in 98. Uh, if they have an ongoing fuel supply for it, because every year and a half or two years or so, most reactors have to be replenished with fuel and this is the key thing about this kind of fuel is that both these research reactors, the first one, the very small one, uh, uses 10% uh, enriched uranium. And the, the, the second one, the 1998 one, uses 19.75% uh, enriched uranium. Once you get to 20%, that's only you know, 0.25 of a percent from uh, having 20%, and that is 20% is the, is the division between medium enriched, I'm sorry, low enriched and medium enriched. Medium enriched gets you up to, if you get up to like 90%, you're in high en highly enriched. It's a very small leap technologically to go from 20 to 90. It's much harder to get from 5, say, to 20. Uh, once you have gotten to 20, you have essentially mastered the, the enrichment process. So Egypt, by the way, in its inception, its, its program's inception, very shortly after its inception, was openly in pursuit of nuclear weapons, and that was under Nasser. But by 1968, after the 67 defeat, uh, the, the Six-Day War, they uh, began to, uh, they, be they basically began to switch just to peaceful uh, research and hopefully working towards uh, peaceful nuclear power, or so they said, because they didn't have the money to pursue nuclear weapons. Uh, and they were negotiating with the United States under Sadat in the, in the 70s and 80s to, get, uh, to start a program. Sadat, in fact, had decided to go for an enlarged civilian nuclear power program to build at least four, maybe up to ten uh, plants in Egypt. That didn't go anywhere. But uh, If they had had the money, they'd have gone for a bomb a long time ago. And in the period following uh, Nasser, oh, by the way, they, they, in 1960 or so, they deliberately uh, emphasized their nuclear program, the nuclear weapons uh, objective, when Israel announced it was developing its own peaceful nuclear power plant in Dimona, when Ben-Gurion announced it. So that was their official... Uh, you know, this is, there was a song by Tom Lehrer 
Egypt's gonna get one too, just to use on you know who. So, <laughs> so, so it was it was a, a well-known issue at the time in the 1960s you know, that Egypt was pursuing a nuclear weapon, and because Israel was going to going to get nukes possibly. So. That has been the position of Egypt in terms of whether they would go for nuclear weapons. If our enemies have nuclear weapons, then we will go for them. Now, when Sadat signed the peace treaty with Israel, that basically, allegedly, you know, took that entire issue off the table. Uh, and nothing really much happened to, to expand its nuclear program uh, under Mubarak. In fact, Mubarak tried to have a nuclear weapons free, news, uh, free zone, rather, uh, in the Middle East, beginning in around 1990, 1992. Uh, he even got the, uh, he, they signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, they approved it under Sadat. It was originally initialed under Nasser. They approved it under Sadat, but they didn't sign the additional protocol, which requires the, 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 the nation itself to allow spot inspections. So they basically only have to voluntarily report to uh, the IAEA, the International Agency for uh, Atomic Energy, uh, themselves on a the, the voluntary basis. So the uh, situation now is that after they went to this nuclear uh, free zone, and now it has become a weapons, nuclear weapons of mass destruction, WMD free zone, they uh, actually got managed to avoid having to sign the, the NPT uh, additional protocol by getting, you know, to get, them to get the other powers to sign on to this initiative to re remove all these weapons from the Middle East, meaning Israel's weapons. They got the, the British, the Americans, and the Russians to back their initiative, uh, and that, that allowed them not, not to proceed with signing the additional protocol and also got those other countries behind their drive to uh, eliminate these nuclear weapons that it was presumed only to be in the hands of, of Egypt, I mean, of Israel. So Israel was their real objective here. It was, not, it was not that they wanted to remove any chance that they would have nuclear weapons ever, but rather that they wanted to disarm the Israelis. And of course, if you would ask them, they'd say, of course we want no one to have nuclear weapons or, or any sort of weapons of mass destruction. But they haven't even signed the agreements to deal with uh, chemical and biological weapons either. So they themselves have left an, an ambiguous position, that left themselves in an ambiguous position. So these issues uh, were already uh, blurry under Mubarak even. But Mubarak himself said that he would not go for nuclear weapons unless Iran developed nuclear weapons. And that was the position of the other Arab countries as well, officially. But in 2000, for the IAEA discovered that there had been illegal activities, or certainly questionable activities, in Egypt in its nuclear program. They discovered traces of enriched uranium, highly enriched uranium, apparently, and other signs of doing, they were doing experiments that were not purported or authorized by the IAEA. So they issued a very mild report. At that time, the, the agency was under, uh, the Egyptian, uh, I'm sorry, the IAEA was under uh, Mohammed al baradai who was uh, an Egyptian himself and a lawyer based in Vienna, who, who had, uh, who's also been accused of having coddled the Iranian nuclear program, and uh, pr quite credibly accused, I believe. And uh, he was he actually encouraging, when I was still in Egypt, he was encouraging Egypt to go for a, nuclear, a civilian nuclear power program. So, uh, He didn't, you know, really enforce the regulations too strictly with the Egyptians as it, as it should, have, as should have happened at the time they discovered these violations, which were rediscovered. I mean, they had been repeated in 2007, 2008, and still nothing was done. The file may still be open under Egypt, uh, for Egypt under the IAEA, but no, so far nothing further has been reported from the IAEA itself about Egypt's activities. Now, this is where things were uh, near the end of the Mubarak era, uh, and just before uh, he was overthrown, he, was, he decided to go ahead with a program that had to build four nuclear reactors. And about 2007, 2008, he was going for this. 
But that was put on hold by the revolution. Then it was brought back under the revolution. And uh, then it was frozen again because of the revolution itself. And there was actually a riot in the site, uh, Andaba, as, as the site on the Mediterranean, about 120 kilometers west of Alexandria, where they planned to build this first plant. And they'd already begun some construction there, and the local people rebelled against it, and they tore the place down, apparently. They also got a hold of some nuclear materials that were stored there, some radioactive materials. We don't even know what they are, and they're floating around loose somewhere. So, not only do you have to worry about their intentions, but even their unintentioned, unintended acts can be uh, a problem for us. Now, fast forward through the revolution. In August of 2012, uh, Mohammed Morsi, the newly elected president of Egypt, was invited to Iran as, because Egypt at that time was the head of the non-aligned movement and was turning over its chairmanship to uh, Ahmadinejad in Iran. And uh, so Egypt and Iran have not had relations since 1979 because of the revolution and because uh, Sadat had taken the Shah in for, for, uh, as, as a friend who needed a place of refuge and also treatment for cancer. But he died there and is buried there. Uh, so this was a major step for him to go to Iran. And he did go. And just before he went, the Iranians offered to assist Egypt's nuclear program. And when he went to Iran, he spoke at this conference with Ahmadinejad in tandem, calling for the, you know, the, this uh, new idea of the weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, which there's going to be a big conference for in Helsinki in December of this year, next month. The uh, Iranians, and the Israelis, either one of them will attend this conference. But the Egyptians have said, under Morsi, that they may drop their membership in the NPT if the uh, conference is not successful. And no one thinks it could be, because it could possibly be successful. So it's, it's just, a, it's really a joke. But uh, no one is paying any attention to this issue. Now, it wouldn't take a great deal for Egypt to perhaps get assistance from Iran and get up to speed, you know, with nuclear enrichment. Or they might get enriched product from somewhere else. They may already have the missile technology to launch medium-range nuclear warheads. Uh, they were certainly trying to get it from us in uh, the 1990s. There was a big scandal of, of it of a contractor or somebody working with the, uh, it's actually somebody in the Egyptian embassy in Washington who was trying to get uh, te missile technology secrets uh, to use in the Egyptian military, uh, discovered by the CIA, I think. So they have a history of some clandestine activity, even under Mubarak. What can we expect from them under the Muslim Brotherhood, which believes in taqiyya, which believes in lies, which believes that whatever is necessary, you know, must be done to achieve their ends. Um, you certainly cannot take any of their statements on this issue at face value, unless they say they're going to go for nuclear weapons, then you can believe that. But, but uh, for example, uh, he, President Morsi has not really uh, confirmed that they're going to go ahead with the civilian development of this program. But two things to remember. One is that he, he, he was in New York uh, uh, for the United Nations General Assembly in September. And when he was there, he told Charlie Rose in this extraordinarily, you know, hagiographic interview um, that uh, he would do everything in his power to make sure that Egypt has, and the Egyptian people, get the benefit of civilian nuclear power. So that was more or less a declaration he intends to go forward with his program. The, the program plans were presented to him for, you know, for approval on July 8th, which is the same or a day before, uh, actually, that he, I think it was the day before, the, the, the day he issued the ultimatum to bring back the parliament, which caused the crisis with the military. 
that everyone remembers, I hope, uh, in, from last summer, which the Muslim Brotherhood ultimately won. And they won it, by the way, because there was no real conflict. It was really a, a sort of negotiations process. Uh, the military was in there legally in the right to dissolve the old parliament because it had broken the election laws. It was established you know, in, in using the using uh, an, illegal, an illegal procedure regarding uh, running independent candidates versus party candidates, and it was dissolved. So. Uh, what really caused them all to get along so well at the end, and why, why, why the top leadership of the army resigned, is Mohammed Hussein Tantawi, the, the Supreme Ca uh, Commander of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, SCAF, and his number two, Sami Anan, to resign in August, was that, uh, first of all, their, their staffs themselves are full of Muslim Brotherhood sympathizers, and the officer corps and the ranks are riddled with Muslim Brotherhood sympathizers and even Salafi sympathizers, and uh, their, their, real, their real difficulty was not about who would run the country, but what would happen to those who used to run the country, because Tantawi intended to resign anyway. Uh, he was uh, given, he and Anand were both given uh, ad advisor to the president's position. That basically assured their safety, we, 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 one assumes, for the, for the time being. You can't really assume too much. But they possibly were going to go to jail because they had been associated with Mubarak. And that was the whole issue between them. So uh, clearly some sort of modus vivendi was worked out and they decided to uh, give these people an honorable way out, as it were, maybe to be dealt with later. And everything, everything about this process should be considered uh, provisional because everything that the Muslim Brother has tried to do up until this date has been with its eye on the future. It's been like this, like in Egypt we have this saying, uh, that the camel is a creature with you know, a, a much greater uh, future vision. It looks ahead. It, doesn't, it looks forward at the horizon as it walks. Whereas the donkey, the bark was often confused, uh, you know, compared to the donkey. The donkey, when it walks, looks down hesitantly at his feet. It doesn't look up and forward. So uh, he, he's really had the inside of the camel where he wants to go. But the Muslim Brotherhood itself has been like this camel trotting through the desert towards its distant destination, very patiently, with great endurance. And they're now very close to having everything they need, but they don't want to jeopardize their relationship with their key allies yet, which is why they haven't yet openly gone to war with us, or our allies. But so long as the Muslim Brotherhood remains in power, you can assume that they're working towards these goals. They have been working towards them for so long that nothing they say for public consumption should be taken literally. Um, a very quick point about uh, what happened in 2000, I'm sorry, the September 11, 2012, two months ago, Mohamed Morsi himself was probably involved in the embassy assault in the sense that he was tweeting comments like uh, the, Muslim, the Prophet Muhammad, God's peace and salvation be upon him, our blessing and salvation be upon him is a red line and anyone who you know, transgresses against him, we will, view as, we will treat as an enemy. So he was actually encouraging the protests. And he's aligned with a group that is trying to free Omar Abdurrahman from prison. You, remember, he, you may remember he actually called for the release of Omar Abdurrahman. That group was the one that originally called the protests. And he withdrew embassy security. He withdrew the sort of security that would normally surround the embassy that would prevent anyone from getting over our walls. So we have to assume that he was complicit in the whole thing. And he was slow to denounce it. And, th and then during his conversation with Charlie Rose, he said, the Egyptian people, people didn't notice this interview. It was amazing. Amazing it got no coverage. He said, the Egyptian people hate America. And it's legitimate for them to focus that hatred in protests against the US Embassy. Nobody's noticing this remark. Nobody paid attention to it. But he was saying, he also said, we're not like President Obama had said at one point, but retracted it, we're not friends, or we, we are not allies. Uh, and he said, well, we're friends. We're, we're, what are friends? There's no diplomatic term for it. You know, so you're either an ally or you're not. You're not you know. 
So uh, I, I think it's quite extraordinary that we still, we still hope that he will toe the line with us. Uh, we still hope he will cooperate with us and the Israelis. But what's happening in Sinai is an extension of his own laxity towards the, the uh, militant groups in Sinai and his cooperation with some of them. And I think that perhaps we're going to see more and more of these raids and perhaps leading up to an, an, an incident that can be used to justify, when they feel strong enough, justify uh, breaking the peace treaty with Israel. And from that point on, I hope I can take questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Raymond. Um, uh, before we um, begin with questions, I just want to tell our, our friends from the media who are here that uh, we have um, a request of you. Everything that Raymond has said, all of the questions that will be asked in this Q&A session are on the record, but anything that is said after that which might involve other topics or business, we'd like you to refrain from printing because that is normally the kind of confidential uh, material that we share at our regular Stanton lunch, so if you will honor that, uh, I'd very much appreciate it. Um, all right, um, let's, uh, let's begin with the uh, questions. We've got microphones on either side. Let's start back here. Dan, can you... Uh, Here's the microphone. Wait for the microphone, if you would, so we can make sure we get it on the record. Okay. You touched on the fact that uh, there was a lack of process and transition uh, mm -hmm. that then encouraged a Mo Muslim Brotherhood takeover as opposed to being able to build democratic yes. uh, or secular forces that would be pro-American. Yes. What can you say, you know, in terms of lessons learned from that that we could apply to the rest of the Arab Spring? Because obviously the whole region is in turmoil and one of our challenges is how do we identify, how do we uh, develop, how do we support people that are going to be uh, pro America on this. In other words, what were the specific mistakes and mm, what can we mm -hmm. do differently going forward as camels? <laughs> okay, great. Rather than donkeys, yes. Uh, well, uh, there are several issues in that. Uh, one of them is, uh, one thing to remember is that look before you leap. And they didn't look, or they, maybe they looked too well and then they, from their own perspective and they wound up where they wanted to be. Uh, because I really did believe the Muslim Brotherhood was the future in Egypt, I believe. And that's, that's actually, I think, the crux of it. They, they weren't, this, these lessons would be lost upon them because they actually fulfilled their, obje their objective by my analysis. Uh, the, our government was actually supporting them, the Muslim Brotherhood, in my, in my opinion. Even though it might have entertained other options, they viewed them as the future and they therefore decided to work with them. Yeah, they didn't necessarily b agree with everything the Muslim Brotherhood believes in, but they wanted to work with them. They thought they could win, win them over to their side. Uh, mm -hmm. Wait for the microphone, will you please? Hi, I'm former Foreign Service, Middle East, sure. Europe. Yeah, yeah, great. When you say the American government... I'm saying the executive branch, not the diplomatic... Are we the, the intel uh, community, DOD, state policy? And yeah. Who in the American government... I think that the advisors around about? President Obama... I mean, uh, James Clapper seemed to think that... Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was a nice secular liberal organization. Uh, President Obama must have been getting from someone the idea that the Muslim Brotherhood was an important player that they could work with, or they wouldn't have made such an effort to get them into that, into that uh, speeches audience. Uh, I can't tell you that I can't tell you the chain of command. You know where, where, where everything, where, where, where the sources for all of this. I can just tell you that the the obvious policy implications and what they must have been able to see that whoever, whoever designed this, it must have been in the executive branches, I don't think most diplomats in, in Amer the American Foreign Service would want to promote the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't believe that at all. I believe these are people who are closer to the president. He's, for example, he's got a woman named Dalia Mugahed who works with him, who is uh, a very obviously a Hamas sympathizer. And she, she's his liaison with the, with the Muslim world. And his speech in Cairo was allegedly written by a Saudi re public relations firm. So uh, th this is, uh, you know, <laughs> somewhere this stuff is, is, is operating. At the, it's, it's at the highest level. I don't think it's coming from the bureaucracy. It's at the highest level. Raymond, let me, let me just yeah, yeah. follow on um, those first two questions because they invite another. You mentioned very early on in your remarks that there was a belief by most of the high-ranking policy officials in this country and probably members of Congress that mm -hmm. Muslim Brotherhood represented a, an emerging democratic base. 
They mm -hmm. clearly did not. Yes. Is there a democratic base in Egypt? Is it the so-called the secular parties, the Wafid party, or and is it big enough to sustain any kind of yes. potential ruling majority? I would say that there is a democrat, potentially democratic base, a potentially strong democratic base. Uh, it didn't appear that way in, as much in the first days of the revolution because the Muslim Brotherhood had so well, so thoroughly stole the show, even though people didn't see it. I mean, to me, it was obvious that they were running it. And I thought that the secular liberals were just very weak. But if you saw it during the runoff, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis made a big mistake. I want to give the Salafis I want, something I don't want, I want to address as well. But the Salafis and the Muslim Brotherhood behaved so badly in that first parliament under the, at the revolution that they scared a lot of people that otherwise shared their values and that would have voted for them, that wants Sharia law, for example. But the style of their government was so weird, <laughs> it scared even them. So uh, there was a great longing for the kind of order and somewhat liberal atmosphere that existed under Mubarak, which was a sort of faint echo of what existed in the previous liberal de secular democratic experiment not totally secular, but under the king, there was a liberal democratic experiment before the revolution of 52. And these people saw that last fading bit of liberalism in society disappearing quickly and the sort of sense of tolerance, you know, and enlightenment that people talk about in Egypt. They pride themselves on, you know, uh, uh, you know. So this is, uh, this is all threatened by what happened then. So they, they rebelled against that by voting for Shafiq, Ahmed Shafiq, who was the last prime minister in Mubarak. And he possibly won the election. We don't even know for sure. I mean, there was no open recount or, or, sure. or no, no open actual counting of the ballots. It was done in a very shady way. And Ahmed Shafiq himself believes that he won by a relatively small margin, maybe, as, maybe even as few as 38,000 votes, but he won. And there are many activists in Egypt who believe that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of organizations, there is a whole group of secular liberal organizations that are not really liberal in our sense, and not in every way. And some of them are quite, rab many of them are quite rabidly anti-Israeli. That's what really bound all these movements together. But they are at least not going to impose an Islamist regime if they are in power, and, they, and you can talk to them in a different way. And you can work with them in a different way. And they should, be, they should have been developed. They should have been uh, nurtured. All the aid went to Islamists that I know of. All the aid to develop democratic institutions in Egypt prior, to, like civil, civil society, was that was going to the Islamists primarily. And aid to, get, aid to the Muslim Brotherhood to get their prisoners out of jail and stuff like that. So it was, that was the focus of the human rights groups. They were the great, in a call celeb of the human rights groups, the Muslim Brotherhood prisoners. Hmm. So it was a missed focus, yeah. Uh, we had, um, let's see, uh, we had a question right here. Andy, you want to give the microphone right there? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about Takia as it relates to how the author, Mahfouz, Najib Mahfouz, developed it in his books, and Takia? Takia? Yeah. I may not Mahfouz. be pronouncing it correct. Oh, your name is, the, the pronunciation is fine. Uh, okay. Both Taqiyya and the Muslim Brotherhood, I mean the Muslim uh, Nagib Mahfouz were correct, correctly pronounced. No, what I'm responding to is that Mahfouz himself is not an Islamist, so he did not practice Taqiyya. He was an anti-Islamist. And he was stabbed by Islamists, in fact, uh, in 1994. Uh, in Oct October 14th, 1994, he was stabbed by an Islamist coming out of his house. He was, getting, he was getting, sitting in a car. Normally, I'd have been sitting in that car with him, but I was uh, detained in, in America for a week. I was, uh, had to t take care of something. I delayed my return, and I wasn't in the car when he was actually in the, stabbed. But uh, he... Uh, Want to tell you an interesting antidote about him. He was, he was, by the way, he was very old. He died at the age of 94 in 2006. This was in 94, he was 82. And uh, in January of 2000, 1995, rather, the next January, I was, he was still recovering, just out of the hospital. Someone from the German embassy called me and asked me to set up a meeting with Mahfouz. Uh, and this man who was uh, from the, uh, one of the democratic, one of the, uh, one of the uh, more leftist German parties, a major party, uh, who wanted to tour the Muslim world and correct the, meet Muslim intellectuals and correct the distorted image of Islam, distorted image of Islam that had been caused by terrorism. And uh, I went to Mahfouz at their request and asked him, would he meet this gentleman? And, and he said, uh, how can I correct a distorted image, distorted image of Islam, <clears throat> when I'm someone who was stabbed by Islam. 
So, but he also made very, very many pious statements, you know, so you can't take that as his only view of Islam. Um, let me give the yeah. next question okay. to Sarah. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Um, Raymond, um, we at Amet, since the very beginning of the revolution in Tahrir Square, have been on the hill asking people to just stop and pause in terms of our $1.5 billion a year mm. of military assistance mm. Mm. to Egypt because we mm -hmm. were able to, you didn't have to be much of a prophet, you know, to read the tea leaves and to see which mm. way the mm. Mm -hmm. um, most, you know, and, and we have since the 1979 um, Camp David Accords built up the Egyptian military and taken it from a C minus Soviet equipped military to an A-minus American equipped military. And um, most, most people have, or many, many people and many much more powerful organizations than ours have argued that this is leverage and we, ha and we have to keep mm -hmm. military aid to Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very worried. Um, what, what is your feeling about this? Well, so long as we remain the major source of funding for the Egyptian military and the major source of new technology for the Egyptian military, we do have a little bit of leverage at least. Uh, so there's an argument there. But I believe that the European Union has announced they're going to give $6.4 billion to the Egyptians. Uh, the, the Morsi was in China just before he went to Iran, and he asked them for $3 billion for his nuclear program alone. And that's, that's going to be, there's going to be more as well for that, perhaps, from the Saudis and the Qataris. They've already also an, uh, announced they're going to give uh, Egypt uh, several billion dollars each. And, uh, you know, the Iranians may be giving them something soon, too. So it's been the Iranians that are, and they are allegedly in a hostile relationship still, but they're not, actually. They're actually working together over Syria and other issues. Let's go to this side. Uh, this gentleman right here. Dan, you want to give him the microphone? Uh, could you quickly delineate on the growing relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda? And then the second part of the mm. question I have is, is it possible in your opinion that perhaps the United States government has directly or indirectly funded Al-Qaeda through its support of the Muslim Brotherhood? Uh, well, you know, I can't say I know all the details of the relationship between them. I do know that they share many philosophical points in common. They both believe that we're the most evil thing in the world, our society and our country and our way of life. Uh, they're both militantly anti-Semitic and they both draw inspiration from Hitler. They, uh, they have different strategies. The strategy of the Muslim Brotherhood, as I announced earlier, as I said earlier, was you know, it's dawah, you know, it's just building up slowly through the institutions that exist and creating new institutions in their place. Uh, the, the Al-Qaeda has often been thought of as a nihilistic organization which just wants to destroy. But in fact, to rebuild, you have to first destroy, as some people believe. So you, you basically see a confluence of interest. Uh, the, I think you might see more openly a relationship between them and the Sinai. Because they, but there will not be direct, you know, contact. It will be more like using surrogates. So the Salafis, during this recent, uh, you know, uptick in violence in, the, in August of this year, continuing till today, uh, uh, they uh, the, they allowed the Salafi allies, the Muslim brother allowed their Salafi allies to negotiate directly with the militant groups in, in Sinai to arrange some sort of truce. And this is all sparked by an incident in which 15 Egyptian soldiers were killed by one of these groups that were attempting to get at Israelis inside Israel. And my belief, my fear, is that they are really just sort of lining up, you know, all their, uh, all their ducks, basically, and getting, getting them all in the same row to use them as they wish, not to prevent them from ever attacking Israel, but to have a coordinated strategy. That, or at least to have one and have that strategy in reserve for when they may want to use it. Certainly, they don't want any embarrassing incidents where Egyptian soldiers are killed. And you know that was a big problem for even for Morsi, because he had to show his credibility that he could protect Egyptian troops. It was a, it was a big issue between these Egyptians and Israel the year before, when five or six Israelis were, or Egyptians were killed after eight Israelis were killed inside Israel. They sent people over to just across the border to get the people who were dressed like policemen and military people who had done the attack 
and they uh, they accidentally killed six Egyptians, five or six Egyptians, and there were there was a huge outrage, and then led to the sacking of the Israeli embassy in September of last year. So uh, he has to deal with local, you know, uh, popular opinion. But he also has a long-term strategic vision, which I doubt he's you know, just dropped because he's become president of Egypt. Uh, yes. Um, OK, let's, uh, let's, go, let's go to this side of the table. Andy, can you give oh, that gentleman? One more thing. He, he also mourned. The, the, Egyptian, the Muslim Brotherhood mourned the death of Omar, Osama bin Laden. And they called him a martyr. Sure. This is a mess. Thank you. Um, yeah. You know, we've had a lot of discussion about things that are bad and things that have gone wrong, from our perspective. But assuming that, as far as the Obama administration is concerned, now having won big this last election, that their approaches past is prologue mm -hmm. and going forward, can you sort of speculate, assuming, you know, these correlation of forces don't change, What's the outcome, the result for the United States? Well, we're Where going do to... we wind up? Oh, that's a very good question, and I think it's really the heart of what we're talking about, is where things are going. Uh, I, I want to, because it relates directly to what you're saying, what you're asking, I want to also reconnect that to uh, the previous question. That is the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda. In uh, Syria, the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda probably work together very directly. In Libya, they may as well. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that we're, you know, trying to funnel weapons to, that maybe may have been purchased by the Saudis and the Qataris, but we're funneling them through Turkey, which is also what it run by an Islamist regime, which is essentially a Muslim Brotherhood regime. And our president's closest friend in the, in the, in the world of foreign leaders is, you know, <laughs> uh, Erdogan, Prime Minister of Turkey. And... So uh, the, right there you have a, a, prob a probable you know, confluence between the Al-Qaeda and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood that we are directly feeding into, feeding it weapons. Use, at least through using our expertise and possibly our funding, our CIA expertise. The New York Times reported that we're doing this. Yeah. Uh, let's go to... Wait. And we, there's a Libyan connection to that too, by the way, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, Adam, just wait for the mics right there. And, uh, and to go back to that question that was asked me, to really answer that question. We are creating a situation in which we're going to replace the, the sort of uh, imperfect, to say the least, regimes that existed in the Middle East before, but we, at least they were our allies, with openly hostile regimes that we may actually be funding for the first period of their uh, uh, possession of power that well, they will ultimately use against us. And they're also trying to infiltrate our own society. They're all over here. They're here. They're right in the city. <laughs> Adam. So, yeah. Building on what Sarah had talked about earlier about the aid, yeah. uh, we had a presentation from David Goldman uh, last month about Egypt as well. Yeah. And um, he was talking about the fact that Egypt is pretty much, there's no escape for them. They're going bankrupt. I mean, right yeah. now they got yeah. some money from yeah. the yeah. EC. Yeah. They're going to get some money from the Obama administration, but no one has enough money to keep shoveling it in mm -hmm. to them. So based on that, it would seem to me that this is sort of a waste to give them more money when we mm -hmm. can actually use the money for other things. Plus, how does that apply? We're giving them military aid right now. They clearly need more economic aid than they need military aid. Plus, military aid can kill someone. Economic aid cannot. So yeah. Let what me give you an example strategy? of this. Let me give you an example of this very thing. Right now, we're, we've been actually, since, for several months, since Morsi became president, we were, we were uh, <laughs> discussing giving them $1 billion in, in, in more in additional aid and debt relief. At this moment, Egypt is awaiting delivery of two, new, uh, two e e diesel electric submarines, not nuclear submarines, but two diesel electric submarines from Germany that will cost $1 billion. The same amount as we're giving them. <laughs> so they can use that money to displace you know, uh, other funds and, and to replace other funds. Uh, sorry. And so to get to your question, I think that w w in terms of what we, whether we should fund them or not really, I think we should just ex evaluate the situation and see how much leverage it actually gets us. This crisis, for, for example, is an example, is part of that. This particular crisis over Gaza. 
if it seems as though they're really just using the money to uh, hoodwink us, then I think we should stop. But if you can at least have some control over their behavior, because they are in power, they are real now. But it's no longer truly an alliance. It's an alliance in form and not in content at this point. Uh, ben? Um, Professor, I wonder if you can drill down on the Sinai Peninsula for a second. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of analysts are commenting that the Sinai could be the next sort of ungoverned territory, if you will, from which we might see uh, a new Al-Qaeda foothold. Uh, we see the kinds of smuggling and that sort of thing already taking place. It's already being referred to as sort of this newly emerged lawless region, if you will, right on Israel's doorstep. To what extent are those developments part of Muslim Brotherhood intentions vis-a-vis -vis that region versus genuinely divorced from what the Muslim Brotherhood would like to see happen in the Sinai? It's very hard to say because they, they have this vision of you know, destroying Israel and also destroying us. This is part of their agenda. But tactically and strategically, I think it would be foolish for them to openly ally with Al-Qaeda and to be openly participating in such activities. So, uh, but they could do, be doing it uh, sub rosa, you know, very easily. And uh, this is what I was getting at before in terms of the, the, this, evaluating the current uh, Sinai crisis. Because uh, they, I mean, for example, Morsi was just up in Mansoor, uh, giving a, you know, attending a meeting with uh, some local leaders there. And he went to a mosque, and this imam was praying for death to all the Jews, not just the Israelis, all the Jews, destruction of all the Jews in the United States. And he was like, amen, you know, amin. <laughs> he was clearly uh, supporting it. I mean, he looked very, you know, uh, he was just listening silently, but you could see by his, his gestures that he, and his, his facial expression, that he was agreeing with the man was saying. He cannot come out and, you know, declare this in a, in a meeting with the President of the United States, or, for example, if whatever happens. Uh, but I really think we probably have somewhat better intelligence that we're than people, you know, people in here are, we actually know. So, uh, all I can say is we shouldn't trust them not to do that. Um, let's um, go to this lady. She's had her hand up for some time. Mm -hmm. Dan, if you could. Hi, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, the first is addressing social networking. The second is the um, uh, conference that took place with the UN exclusive is of Israel in Chicago, mm -hmm. addressing the social networking. In 2009, AOL, Cisco, and Intel were hosted by um, Steve Case's wife down at the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. and they were talking about this, the centers that they're opening up and developing for the Gaza youth mm -hmm. to learn skills in. Mm -hmm. Then we have um, O, or 44 then, loping around Silicon Valley, where he went and met with Jobs, Case, all of the bigwigs. And then we have Robert Gibbs living the, leaving the lower pr press office and going over to Facebook. Do you really still think the uprising was an accidental um, uprising, exclusive of America's involvement or Mr. Obama's involvement? Second is um, the Muslim Brotherhood was in Chicago. There was a, a level of um, uh, credentials that Israel didn't have, but people that had lower, groups that had lower levels of credentials were invited. Mm -hmm. Israel was excluded. Yes, I know that. It's a very terrible situation. And yeah. Israel was excluded. This was yeah. all coincidental or before the election. Yes. Uh -huh. And then we have the activities of J Street, with, we all yeah. know that comes through um, Qatar is tied to Qatar and, and Mr. Soros' involvement. Mm -hmm. I want to know the significance of that because I, I don't want us to think that these aren't all connected and accidental. So, oh, I think they're not accidental. <laughs> I think it's coordinated, yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, I, I, I don't know about Gibbs people. going to Facebook. I'm not sure about that. But, but uh, uh, I can, Robert I, Gibbs I, went to Facebook yeah. and there was dodginess yeah. back and forth. He yeah. explained away the timing of his going to Facebook was for a job. Mm -hmm. People that worked in lower press saw it as being a little bit co coincidental. Mm -hmm. He then left the Facebook job before the election with an explanation that fit the people that currently call themselves media. Mm -hmm. And now we have this um, in a coordinated win with 108% in some precincts. So 
Um, well, you know, I, I really, I'm not sure. I would, I would not say all these things are connected necessarily. I would, I would say that in terms of the effect on the ground in the, in the Middle East, our policy has an impact, In our overall policy has an impact. Uh, I, I do think that it's not a coincidence that we, uh, that we have been encouraging the Muslim Brotherhood in, in this way and that they, they have risen to the forefront so quickly. Um, especially in the, the Egyptian example, I think really, really set the pattern for subsequent activity. Uh, but um, one more thing that you could have mentioned is that uh, we also have excluded Israel from the major, Obama has excluded Israel from the major uh, international terrorism forum that they have created, which is chaired by Turkey. And it was Turkey which objected to Israel's presence at the NATO meeting in Chicago. And once again, I want to emphasize our relationship with Turkey is most important to Obama, more important than our relationship with Israel, I think, in his mind. Let's That's take my opinion. one mm. more question. I'm going to go to this side <coughs> down here. Mm -hmm. since, since this is all off the mm -hmm. record. What was our ambassador doing in Benghazi? I mean, it's a small place. Why, was, why, was, why had he left the, uh, uh, you know, the seat of where, to, what was, does anyone have any idea what he was doing there? I mean, I've heard allegations going from that he, w that there are a lot of arms, there are, th that we mm -hmm. get, yes. and that he was dealing, yeah. trying to locate and get those arms and perhaps yeah. sell them to uh, uh, the uh, Syrian Al-Qaeda groups. I, I, I absolutely Well, yeah, I, I, th I think that, that there was, there is, some people believe there is a pipeline between the, um, uh, the people we were working with, and he was particularly Chris Stevens was to, was actually outreaching with uh, and and interacting with in uh, in Libya, and uh, what, you know and the, the idea of supplying the Syrian rebels and it was going through Turkey, and that was this is the allegation and that he was actually involved in trying to retrieve these weapons that had been uh, taken from Gaddafi's stockpiles. And some of them were actually were shoulder fired, shoulder fired missiles that could bring down even civilian aircraft uh, that could be used by terrorists. And uh, shipping them off to Syria, where the, our main connections are through Islamist groups, which of course have liaison with Al Qaeda. And this is an, this, to, this to me is a very very serious matter if it's true. We definitely know that uh, during the Libyan revolution. Chris Stevens was working with uh, the groups that now comprise the Libyan military and, and some of the main opposition people in Syria, as they've gone over there. This guy, Abdul Hakim bin Al Hajj, who was an Al Qaeda commander that we were actually working with during the Libyan uprising, and he was the head of their major Lib militia, and, and now he's off uh, working with the groups that we're supporting in Syria, apparently. So we have a direct connection of some kind with Al Qaeda at this point, you, you may argue. We may, in fact, be dealing with Al Qaeda already in terms of weapons. Yeah, I can't say for sure. All I can say is it's very, it's very uh, alarming, if the, if it's true. Uh, I do think that it's very difficult to separate these groups, the, the so-called harmless Islamists, from the, the more dangerous ones. As the people try to pursue this policy, there really is a very blurred distinction between those which are violently militant and those which are not. Raymond, thank you very much for yeah. your insight and the time you spent with us. I think it's, it's probably safe to say you've probably gotten a better briefing about the ideology that drives some of these actions today than a lot of people at the Defense Department, State, or the CIA have received. Oh, um, oh thank you. Before we, uh, and by the way, that last question was on the record, just to reiterate to our, our press, but what's happening now is not. Um,